He's made me personally $10 million just yesterday alone. I'm swimming in cash. <laughs> and you you, you were under Tim Keller for a little bit? No, that's right. Yeah, I was a church planter in New York City, so I went through a three-year program with Tim Keller's ministry, Redeemer City to City. And so he's not a it. fringe, just random guy trying to make some money out there, <laughs> trying to scam no. pastors. Who got into ministry, got into it because they love God. Okay. They, love, they, they love people. They want to make a difference in their communities. I think the insidious part of it is that we're human beings and we're flawed and we have egos and there's something very sexy and attractive about being the person on the stage delivering God's word. It's not about like it's not a career field where you go and learn you it's like where are the people you're burdened for and then figure out money next and you your tweets do that so good and you find the area you feel like you need to do ministry in and then money comes second and so I was just not taught that. Yeah, man. Well, that's the thing is if, if you really sense that you're called by God to be a full-time pastor, you have to come to terms with there are about 13 states in the U.S. That's just a made-up number. Maybe it's a little more, maybe it's a little less, where you can actually make a living as a full-time pastor. So at the end of last year, I had a really good conversation with my friend Eric, and he does a lot of good work. He pretty much helps anybody transition into a different job, but he, he helped me transition from ministry into the marketplace you talk about all things church ministry i recorded this at the end of last year i didn't know where to put it uh, i felt like this was the right time to share so if you love creativity and discipleship it, and this is your first time checking out this channel hit that subscribe button my goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year so you're early welcome give this video a like and uh enjoy the conversation that we have all right well eric i just want to before we get into having a conversation I just want to say thank you for uh, for me personally. I want to take the next 20, 30 seconds to brag on you because there's a few people that have impacted me a lot, like personally, and you have impacted my life in crazy ways that um, not a lot of people can say. Um, but you, yeah, you have helped me uh, process really deep. We're, we're going deep real early. <laughs> a lot of deep emotions and wounds that I felt and confusion I felt about church life ministry um, things I was wrestling with with God and you your tweets have literally uh, were the reason why I'm in the position one of the reasons why I'm in the position where I'm, I'm at today so I just want to say thank you for your work your ministry um, well, maybe not ministry, but your life, your life ministry, your um, your business of I help pastors get jobs dot com. Thank you so much. And yeah, I can keep going on, but I don't want the whole podcast to be bragging about you. So, well, hey, man, I appreciate that, Anthony. And I, I never told you this before, but I, I think you and I have had very similar stories, um, kind of coming of age in like churches where it was very charismatic, very emotional filled. The decision to go into ministry was based on feelings, not on, you know, wisdom or, or knowledge. And yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, that's why I felt very drawn to work with you. And I'm happy that our, our friendship has continued to blossom. And I'm just sad we're not a Yankee stand. But besides that, I'm happy, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy we can get along. <laughs> Let's go. I was really hoping you would wear a Yankees hat, but that's all right. Um, yeah, no, dude, I think... That was one of the biggest things, I mean, like you said, growing up, because growing up, I was just felt like I was like people always say you got to be called to ministry. And I I never knew what that meant. And I would read books and I still never got it. And I still never like really understood what, what being called to ministry looked like, because I thought that meant for some reason that equated being full time or receiving a paycheck to live off of from a church and can yeah. you like go off the bat on that at all like do you, why why are we in why is that such a like emotional go into ministry aka get paid at a church thing even exist or maybe is it just me no it's not it's not just you it, it comes down to a few things and some of these are insidious and some of these are innocent let's start with the innocent things first um you and I and the folks listening on, on this on this podcast who got into ministry got into it because they love God. Yeah, they love they, they love people. They want to make a difference in their communities, and they look at being a pastor or being full time in ministry as the most effective, efficient 
way to advance the gospel. Yeah. Um, we'll just, we'll start there. That's like the most innocent, pure, that's why we are and, in the ministry. And that's, and that's honestly how I like, that's what I went into it as. So, mm -hmm. yeah, man, I think the insidious part of it is that we're human beings and we're flawed and we have egos and there's something very sexy and attractive about being the person on the stage delivering God's word, right? It, you feel powerful and you feel anointed. You feel like you're God's man set apart for his purposes. And then you kind of mix those two things together and you get the state of pastors today. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's where I can guess that that can be the sticking point for sure. And, and any pastor who says I'm, I'm just the first without the second, in my view, lacks some serious self-awareness. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that with a straight face. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I think that for me, like just for my story, it was, I want to reach people for Jesus. You, you yep. said it perfectly. This burden. But then I wanted to do it in a way that was a.k.a. Uh, Rich Wilkerson, Stephen Furtick. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's what I thought to reach. And then very early into full-time vocational ministry, I was like, oh, no, this is just one method of reaching people for Jesus. And then I started questioning what does even reaching for people for Jesus mean? Is that just – Get, get making them say a prayer and then getting on, them on some sort of you version Bible reading plan because that really doesn't change them. That's not making disciples. And so, yeah, so that is like some of my story of of that. But I, I guess like, do you think just the church in America or America, we Americanize this beautiful gift called church? Is that mm -hmm. like what it comes down to? Yeah, yeah. I have a, I I have a friend. He's a his his name's Jaime. He's Mexican American, and he said to me one time. He said, "Europe made Christianity a society. Um, Mex like Latin America made Christianity a show, and and uh, America made Christianity a business." <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> and and, they, and I'm like, what do you what do you mean by that? And he's like, no, I see of, that, yeah. <laughs> but you but you see in America how there's there's quite literally pastors who are on a career ladder. Yes. And <laughs> you, have, you you ever notice how it's very rare that we as ministry folks are, are called to go to a smaller church? How often do you hear that story? Not very often. <laughs> Oh, well, I, that's, I feel like that's my story now. <laughs> so, or like, you know, maybe Francis Chan, but I think the the scary thing Ooh, about that is, oh, what, how am I going to survive? How am I going okay. to, and so I'm currently right now in Long Island, New York, the basement of where I grew up. And yep. I always had a passion for Long Island. Um, mm -hmm. I always had a passion to start a church on Long Island and I wanted the, I wanted the cooler church on Long Island, meaning louder music, cooler graphics, better musicians, more emotional messages um, when it came down mm -hmm. to it. And this is also like, yeah, I was I really wanted to reach people for Jesus. I still do. And but for me, it's like, let me go to the south for a little bit. Let me go to the Bible Belt where they're killing it and come back and do it great. And I realized like, oh, no, you to do ministry. It's not about like where it's not about like it's not a career field where you go and learn you it's like where are the people you're burdened for and then figure out money next and you your tweets do that so good and i i tried to save some tweets of mine and I, you probably have them but you tweet so much that i couldn't <laughs> just scroll to the ones i want man i'm like just keep scrolling for days yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like but the, like you tweet that a lot and, and so it's like you find the area you feel like you need to do ministry in and then money comes second. And so I was just not taught that. Yeah, man. Well, that's the thing is if, if you really sense that you're called by God to be a full-time pastor, you have to come to terms with there are about 13 states in the U.S. That's just a made-up number. Maybe it's a little more, maybe it's a little less, where you can actually make a living as a full-time pastor. <laughs> I mean, I mean, think about it. How many full-time pastors are making a, a, a decent middle-class living on Long Island? five <laughs> i don't you know what I, mean? I, I don't know and like i money is very not talked about a lot and so uh -huh. it's very secretive which is one of the things that i just don't like anymore um, sure and so yeah like i am i'm like i just didn't know how to do it so that's why i felt like i had to move to away from new york 
Um, uh-huh. Even though Long Island is still expensive, even if you don't, you're not in ministry. Totally, to with, so. totally, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, so that's that's like the even. I would love to move back here, but I'm s- still trying to figure out that part. But um, you will, but man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess like, what? I don't. Know, there's so many different ways I want to go with this, but what what is then? What is the future look like for ch- like pastors and churches? Because if it's not full time, what are they supposed to do? And how? And how? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: is if someone really feels like they're called to be full time vocational ministry, I'm not here to like poop on anyone's parade. Like, go do what you sense that God has called you to do. And the other thing I want to also caveat: I'm, I'm not sure what your audience is. Most pastors I work with are coming from evangelical, AG, Baptist kind of traditions. Like they're not in a part of a denomination that's kind of padding their lives for giving them benefits. I was kind of going back and forth with a guy on Twitter the other day who uh, told me that some pastors he knows are maxing out their 403Bs at like 22K a year. And I was like, I know pastors who are making 22K a year. So I don't know what we're, we're literally on different <laughs> Yeah, what are those churches? I'm going to look up their website real quick. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I said, I thought that I'm going to you're part of it again, man. I need, I need to get on that groovy train. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think the thing that I would advise like young people feeling a call to ministry is what skills can I develop and harness as, as a person that are going to fund my life? Um, whether that's like what you're doing, Anthony, like being creative and uh, being an entrepreneur and figuring out ways to have multiple clients and several re- um, streams of revenue coming in. Um, or someone like myself, who works a traditional kind of eight to five job in learning and development. I'm the director of training at a, at a company here in PA. Um, whatever that skill set might be. And I actually first got into this, I did hear a shout out to Peyton Jones. He wrote a great book called Truth Plantology and Peyton's a registered nurse. Um, and he got that skill set. He knew it. Anywhere you go in the country, need to nurses. The pay is pretty good. You work three days a week, and then the other four days he can utilize, you know, for ministry outside of his kind of healthcare setting. So I'd encourage, you know, folks who feel the call to ministry, what skills do I need to get that can actually help me fund my life? And then that being the the, the first thing. And then, of course, the female education is is also important. But to think that that you're going to be on a, a 40 year track in full-time vocational ministry. Some, some are, some aren't. Um, but yeah, that'd be the thing that I would say is where do the, where do the skills I need to develop and hardest? Because what if God calls you tomorrow to go do ministry in a small town in Maine, I got bad news. There's, there are no churches hiring a full-time pastor in small town, Maine. And you but, literally, can't, why, <laughs> you literally but can't, why, can't, yeah. why we don't hear those stories though. Cause they yeah. don't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't make sense in the Americanized version of church and ministry. Like how bigger, would it, better. How would it make sense if you know you can't make a living doing that? And exactly, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, if if, you, if your goal is I need to feed my family, which is should y'all wear goals? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, and all my yeah, kids yeah. do ramen every day. It's like, well, I'm gonna have to go to where the go to where the work is, so to speak. Yeah, not yeah, necessarily yeah. going to where God's calling me. Yeah. Um, is do you think can you speak on maybe is it a theology issue do you think it starts in the, 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 the theology because like, like i wrestled with like jonah for uh-huh. example like because part of me was like oh i especially when i moved to north carolina like i felt like god was leading me to north carolina um but to me it was like to do ministry like what what was it and it was like, but then I just kept going back to Jonah and being like, okay. well, Jonah didn't want to go. So are you, you disobeying God and realizing that there's more depth to Jonah than just like a typical Americanized thing. So do you think it starts with theology and like, what are, what, can you speak on that and like healing from that wacky theology? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a good question. No one's ever really asked me that before, but I, I think my kind of half big answer would be, a, you know, Charles Spurgeon has a quote, and his quote is, don't preach the gospel to save your soul. Mm. <laughs> Which, what does that mean? A lot of us get into the ministry because we think that's our way to earn God's love and favor. Mm. And, and I think until you can uncouple your identity as a Christian with your identity as a person in ministry, it's going to be really hard to make those tough decisions to do something different vocationally. 
and I you know, can't speak for all pastors, but I can speak for myself. There is a sense inside of me that needs to continually be sanctified that says that I'm not, you know, full-time committed to ministry, trusting God with for every little detail in my life and his church for every expense for my family. I'm somehow a subpar secondary Christian. It's like, well, where's that come from? Um, That's it, dude. That is it. All of the dude. Oh my gosh. All of, like every time I would it, question I mean, or just like, maybe yeah, it's, it's, like come up with like, Hey, what about this? What about meaning financial needs? It was always like, you have a lack of faith in trusting in God, just trust in God and he'll provide. And to me, is like I'm a very logical person. Like, does that mean like God's just going to deposit? And I've seen where God's blessed me throughout my life in of different course. ways. And but yeah, like that's still not a great strategy to provide and thinking about your future and kids future and stuff like that. But yeah, it was always just trust God. <laughs> yeah. And that's. Yeah. And and but also do the work like trust that god will provide as you do your part as well there's an african proverb that says as you pray move your feet um and i love that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's spot on i mean i i can't eat doritos and, and drink dr pepper all day and say i'm trusting god and take care of my health like it's laughable and i can't just say okay well i know that this uh you know isn't a long-term sustainable way to live my life being in full-time ministry but i'm just going to trust god it's like well maybe god wants you to do something a little bit different and expand your your vocational options and for a lot of pastors and myself included we think we're like failing god if we don't if we don't trust him fully with our finances and going out and getting a job but i mean a news flash most christians will never be full-time in the church so we don't call we don't call them failures why would we call ourselves failures i mean i why, but yeah, like I, I'm not gonna name the name, but I went to this camp with a, with my youth group, and there was a salvation call, altar call, okay. and there was an altar call for ministry. I have it. And I saw, I was just like, there's something wrong with that, and I couldn't uh -huh. like label it. And it's like it is this dichotomy that, like you mentioned, like Baptists and. Uh -huh. Uh, maybe Southern, well, Southern Baptist, but maybe Southern churches. It's like there is this, you're a Christian, but then if you want to really be the next step, then you're a disciple. But then if uh -huh. you really want, then it's your ministry. <laughs> and like these three, and it's like none of that is biblical worldview. And so guys yeah, like yeah. you, your tweets, other people in the space, Comer, and you, 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 print, like you were under Tim Keller for a little bit, or is that... No, that's right. Yeah, I was a church planter in New York City, so I went through a three-year program with Tim Keller's ministry, Redeemer City to City, and yeah, man. And here's the thing: is is so he's not a fringe, it, just random guy trying to make some money out there, <laughs> trying to scam no, pastors. No, not at all, man. I mean, I love <laughs> pastors, and I was a pastor for a long time and in ministry for a long time. And even though, like the line you said earlier, Anthony, like you're called to ministry. But Ephesians 4.12 says a pastor is equipped with saints for the work of the ministry. Isn't everybody called the ministry? Yeah, I'm confused. Yeah, and, that's, <laughs> and that's why, like, Ephesians 4, just, like, it never, I don't know. There's always been scripture. I, I'm just going to say this yeah, for you. all. Hey, hey, there's hey, been scripture hey. in my life that didn't really click and make sense. And it was just like, oh, that's just Bible Bible knees or something. Like, it's just uh -huh. not supposed to make sense. It's old, whatever. But uh -huh. all of a sudden, these things like oh this starts to make sense we just have i just have like this wrong paradigm to actually see it and it does yeah. make sense it is beautiful and there are multiple expressions of the church and there's not one's better than the other but like yeah it's just i feel like the c culture i grew up in we've missed that we miss that and part of that i think it is at least for me it's like if you really want to make a difference for jesus you go into ministry and that's if you really want to make a difference for Jesus, be a disciple because you're in ministry. <laughs> like, that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, man. No, you're spot on. And, like, what, what does that communicate to the majority of people who don't go into church ministry? It's like you're ministering to your coworkers, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family is, is somehow less significant. I mean, even going, like, this is getting very, like, nerdy right now. But if you, like, no, walk do it. Into, <laughs> if you, like, walk into a church, you ever notice how, like, oftentimes, like, the pulpit's elevated? 
right? Yep. <laughs> like, isn't that, yep, 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 yep. It's like it's like so interesting and how like the pastor's facing towards you and like you're facing towards him. But then if you go to a Catholic church when the priest breaks the bread, he's always facing towards the altar because everyone's facing towards God together. It's like yeah, like we don't yeah, have yeah. we don't have that in evangelical tradition. We have you know the 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 holy man or holy woman of God is the is the God's chosen person. I'm not saying that he or she isn't, but we're yeah, all yeah. God's chosen chosen people, aren't we? And I think when Christianity becomes a, a spectator passive activity where most folks can show up, hear a word, get some worship, take you know, take communion, give an offering, go home, and that's the beginning, the end of their of their life in Jesus. Man, that is a that's a smaller life than he has for them. And then yeah. but, and, and they don't need to do ministry because they pay someone else to do that. It's like, well, time out here, man. You're you're all called to minister, whether you're working a mechanic or a bus driver or a teacher, you're called to be a minister of Jesus Christ every single day. So do you think then okay, so that we're and so just having conversations recently with people, they'd be mm-hmm. like, Well, I I agree with your saying. Um, but I guess what what is then you know, I gr- like I really saw it in the church culture in the South of just like, that's the air you breathe is very yeah. attendance. Like New York culture is could, it could, it's still like that to some degree. It's just, I guess what, I guess then if there is like a attractional model church, um, is that the, like, how, how how like that does and i just guess want to clarify like that does it could work but it might not be the best do you i guess where you get what i'm saying like i'm trying to formulate like a more concrete question but um because usually people from like when i say this stuff it's like oh you're a hater or no like it could still work and stuff like that um but that's not what we're saying right no, no listen man i I, I'm, I have no interest in, in tearing down anybody's idea of what they think the church should or shouldn't be. Um, I'm just a person that puts some ideas out well, there. Well, I, do. I, I, want, I want to do that. You, so you want you, to tear it down? Eric does. I want, I want that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that responsibility. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess the question to mark in my mind is, is like if churches are just are simply creating consumers, and a, a, a mega church, a traditional church can do that, and a house church of eight people can do that, then I think there has to be some honest conversations of what, what are we producing yes. as, a, as an institution. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. It's just like, to me, it's like, a, it's like a fact. I see it as a factory. And it's just like the factory of uh, a traditional model. You could <laughs> become a much, like, mature <laughs> disciple, but you might have some wrong frameworks, whatever. And obviously everybody's different, but there, I think there are better systems. I guess my point is, I think there are better systems when the pillars are focused like, okay, as a, as someone leading this community, I'm a, making sure my job is to equip people, not, no. and I feel like a lot of the church and a lot of church experience, a lot of people I talk to, it's you go to a church where they're producing this thing and not really equipping you. And when I ask um, questions to that person, like, hey, do you feel equipped in ministry? And that doesn't mean the a lot. This is another thing. It doesn't mean, like, do you have the right answers? Because that's how we Westerners think, right? Like, And that's yeah, very important. Yeah. But what is then ministry? Are you equipped to do ministry? And I think that's, like, the key word, redefining what ministry is so that it could be all of life and it could be leading your family well, leading work well, doing work well, mm-hmm. being good. Uh, co-rulers genesis one narrative um and yeah yeah, so i think that at least on my ends uh, i kind of just went on a rabbit trail but um that to me is like at least my heart is for people to yeah whatever system you're in tractional whatever they could produce not great whatever systems are broken because we're broken but I think there are better systems that could or better highly like a better ROI as business defines it. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I'll, I'll, I'll you, you called his name earlier, so I'll give a shout out to the late and great Tim Keller. He had a, a saying which I thought was profound. He said, "Most cities or most towns would benefit more from ten churches of fifty than one church of five hundred. Yeah. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. 
um, because you know, they're smaller, they can be more incarnational in their community, they can adopt a school, they can adopt a park, they can you know, be present with their neighbors. She said, but one church of 500 is also beneficial if it has a kingdom vision for those other smaller churches. Sure, yeah. Because I, I'm sitting here as a beneficiary of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, which was a mega church. Yeah. And I got free tra free training for three years to plant a church that was not a Redeemer church, not even a PCA church. Oh, wow. Because they had, because they had a kingdom vision, right? And I think that if there's a large church pastor listening to this, that's always the first thing I'm curious when I talk to mega church guys is, what are you doing for your community? Because God's given you so many tremendous resources and, and most are doing, both are doing quite a bit. I will say this mm. just to, because it's probably worth sharing. I, I had lunch with a mega church pastor last Friday and he told me something that was so interesting. He's like, I'm the CEO of a really, really complex organization. This is like, not why I got into ministry. <laughs> and I was like, dang, that's real. <laughs> and that hurts. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, yeah, and like I can, like I, it's easy for you and me to be like, yeah, man, forget that. But dude, when you're in it, it's like, yo, it's it's not not a joy ride by any stretch of the imagination. Well, a lot of the, a lot of this is because the church that I was a part of was like feeling the same way. And one of the lines I keep going back to is like, a lot of church leaders build like start climbing this ladder on the building thinking it's this awesome building and realizing like they were climbing the wrong building yeah. <laughs> and um yeah that's like i and, and that's what like um a lot of my heart a lot of my italian comes out and people don't know how to <laughs> how to take my italian and passion and so some of the times it comes out as like i'm angry and like i'm putting shame on pastors when it's not that and it's my heart is for like for the local church and for pastors totally. and ministries. Oh, you cut out for a second, Anthony. I lost you, brother. Oh, we didn't stop. There you go. Uh it, it stopped when you said my um my heart is for local pastors and for their ministries and then it stopped. Yeah, I mean yeah, that's pretty much it. And not to bash them or whatever. So um Yeah. Yeah, but I think the other thing too that I'm always curious about is, let's just suppose there is a, a large church pastor who's listening, who has a 2,000 person congregation, says, "Man, this is like bad for my soul. I don't want to do this anymore." Yeah, like, talk to what? them, please. Talk to them. I want. I've always wanted to know, like, what stops you from doing something different? Like, what stops you from, you know, going to a smaller church and being a Bible? What stops you from going to the marketplace? What stops you from? Stepping down, becoming you know the the kids pastor, and like someone else would be lead pastor in that church, and I think you know I can't I'm not in their brains. I don't know, but I think for some of them, it's they say they don't like it, but they kind of do like it. <laughs> you know, they, they it, like being that guy. Yeah, it, and it is kind of power. I mean, not a power trip uh -huh. in the bad way, but there is like I don't know. I think a lot of these guys, and this is I was having a conversation recently, like. I'm learning a lot of things about entrepreneurship, starting a business that are so like, I, I hear all the time in bigger churches and bigger cultures. And like a lot of the leadership stuff is great. I love leadership stuff, but it's like implemented it in ministry. And it's like, yeah, this is good things, but uh, what, is, what is it actually turning into? And what is it actually like producing? But yeah, I, I, I I think a lot of it is because we're trying to build this thing, Americanized thing, but the hey. purse, like, I guess, do you, it's I think the thing that, um, I think another reason why is just money, why pastors hey. don't want to mm -hmm. switch. Um, because if any time you change any culture of any organization of anything, mm -hmm. it will, there will be people that don't like it because people are just like the same thing. And they like what they mm -hmm. like, and they've came for that thing. So that when you don't mm -hmm. have it, mm -hmm. um, like the church I was a part of, just we we did like a Maverick City type style worship for like a few months, and just like on the ground instead of on the stage. And the amount of people that walked away and was like, I don't want to be a part of this church anymore because we moved musical instruments twenty feet <laughs> uh, is crazy. And yeah. so then. I understand as a pastor when you're, you know, you're 
your income is dependent on people staying at a church and giving, you don't want to upset the crowd. But I guess uh -huh. do you want, can you speak to that pastor that like wants to make a difference, but feels like they'll lose it, their entire income? Like, can you talk to them? Because if you can, if you could talk to them and they don't have to worry about finances, because you're talking to me at least, like if I was, in, uh -huh. this is what I would be struggling with. Um, can you talk to them in the sense of like, Hey, do what maybe you have to strip down, but you know, <laughs> there's ways that you'll still be okay financially. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the work that, that I specialize in Anthony, which is kind of this idea of what would happen if, if pastors took a Bible slash colo approach to ministry where they weren't beholden to the money coming in on Sunday, not only feed their own, feed themselves, but then also they have a church staff they're thinking about. Yeah. They have a building they're trying to maintain. They have you know all sorts of stuff that's that they're juggling. I mean, I just can't imagine the pressure that a, a, a full time pastor feels. That man, if I like make the wrong person mad or the wrong group of people mad, the whole thing can get blown up. Um, that's that's incredible pressure. So what I often advocate for is maybe that wasn't pressure they're ever supposed to feel, and maybe you're supposed to go out and have a have a full time job, and maybe you receive a small stipend from the from the church you're leading. But you know, I was always a bivocational pastor, and one thing I really appreciated and valued about that is if someone got mad at me and they took their kicked their tire and they left, just like, well, we we love you and we're sad that you're upset. <laughs> But the, we're not going to close our doors because you took your paycheck and left. Now let me just we took your tithe and, and left. Now let me just put a little spin on there too. Um, are we letting these adult language on your podcast or no? Ah, uh, go for it. <laughs> okay. How about we just use this for instead? Just because you're Bible doesn't mean you're allowed to be a jerk either. You're still a pastor. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you still need to care for people and love people and serve people well. You can't just say, "Well, I get my paycheck elsewhere." Therefore, you know, middle finger to you. I'm going to do it all one. You still want to serve people well, but there's a lot of freedom when you can say, hey, we're going to move our instruments to the, to the ground and you might not like that. And that's OK. This is the direction we feel like God's going and we hope you stay and that you engage. But if you don't, you know, there's other churches in town that you can check out and you don't have to like lay in bed at night thinking I can't pay my staff because of a decision I made. Yeah. Um, which a lot of pastors feel. Yeah. Um, that. Yeah. I guess we've created a system. We created this thing that like God's like, and we feel all this pressure that is like, we're just not designed for, um, mm -hmm. do you then think, um, that it's like perfect scenario. Do, are we supposed to, I, I I'm gonna go there. So if you don't, I'll answer. If you don't want to answer, that's totally fine. But do you think we're even supposed to pay pastors to begin with? Like. I know we're going to go talk about acts where, you know, they and stuff like that. But is that like, are we like, are pastors supposed to get paid? Do you, if you don't want to talk about that, I'll, I'll rant on that. But well, here's the thing, man, is I oftentimes hear people say, well, Paul, Paul, the 10 maker, you should be 10 maker. And it's like, okay, fair enough. However, if you study Paul's life, he was a 10 maker. He had a skill in which he can make money. He also took some money from churches that he helped plant. Mm -hmm. He also refused to take money from other churches he helped plant because they were so screwed up. <laughs> and lived, <laughs> he lived a simple life. He was not, you know, he was not balling by any stretch of the imagination. And he also took advantage of people's generosity. I think of the story where he stayed at Lydia's home and did ministry out of her home because she was a wealthy businesswoman. He kind of did those five things simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. So yes, so yes, he was a ten maker. But he also did take, you know, some money from some of the churches that he started, which you know, he says in scripture, I don't know the verse right now, but it's like those who preach the gospel should make their living off the gospel. And people tell me that all the time on Twitter. It's like, yes. And the person who said that literally worked a job. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not like throw a bomb in it. Pastors should never be paid. I'm not quite that extreme because at the end of the day, man, it's a job. And if, if you're the pastor, let's say you're pastoring a hundred people at a, at a church and you're doing that voluntarily and you wake up one Sunday morning and your kid was up all night puking and your wife is in a bad mood and you got a sore throat and it snowed the night before and like, I just don't feel like going in today. 
this is going to sound crass, but sometimes a little stipend you get from the church is like, no, I, I, this is still my job. I still got to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and if you're yeah. a full, full volunteer, it's like, eh, maybe we'll just do a Zoom church today. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know, especially if you work, especially if you worked all the week before and the week after. So no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not in a place to say like, no, pastor should not be paid, period. But I am in a place to say, if the church is the only place you're receiving your income, it might be time to reevaluate how you're receiving your income. Yeah, unless you're Joel Osteen. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I'm glad that was a great answer. I was just, a, I didn't know if like, you know, cause I, there's people that I know that were like, you can't like pastors shouldn't be paid. And just from the work we've done, I've like in my cynical, you know, mentality, I'm like, yeah, like I started leading that. And then it's like, <laughs> no, wait, hold on. Like, it's, you know, just because you just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so there's obviously wow. pros and cons to both. And there's amazing pastors that are doing amazing work that are getting, hey, hey. that are provided for, and we, hey, uh -huh. we need them to keep doing that. And then there's some that were kind of in a similar boat I that I was, where just finances were struggling, and that was like a lot sure. of the stress that came from that. And you didn't know what to do because you felt like God's calling was attached to a paycheck, and now that's not. Uh -huh. It's very freeing to be on the other side of that. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. I had a hundred percent, and I always like, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. So we had a woman who read, I think it's called Pagan Church or Pagan Christianity, one of those books. I forget which one, but one of the premises of, of that text was that pastors should not be paid. Okay. So she read this. She read this book, and like that was like a whole idea from something outside of the church, and we kind of co-opted it. And like any pastor who gets paid is, you know, a scam artist. <laughs> the ironic. The, the ironic thing about it was this lady was like the laziest secretary they ever met and didn't do jack squat for the church <laughs> so it's like it's like yeah you're gonna be all high and mighty saying pastors shouldn't be paid and you don't even like let the finger to help like yeah, you show that... up once a month and and you're the worst yeah that's so i think to me don't believe people's words leave their actions <laughs> yeah that's why like i'm just always going to be that type of person that will always whatever church is involved like i'm always going to go above and beyond so that's just my worldview and like uh -huh. i'm always gonna do that regardless if i get paid or not so but then there's people that are like that that you know exactly that's a great great situation i mean, I, I, I i called i call them kobo karen <laughs> <laughs> they're all about kobo ministry because they're like as long as it doesn't affect them they don't have to do anything yeah yeah well yeah so i'm just grateful for your work i'm grateful for your um what you're doing and i think more people need to know about it because i think that's unfortunately where the church is going um where uh -huh. just financially speaking and the uh -huh. rate health i think what we're, we're cutting off the fat in the american church um and it's going to be stronger because of it but some people think you know we're not going to be stronger and the rapture is going to happen and whatever but i see it as a good thing um but yeah is there um i want to for people to be like okay i want to kind of like can we i mean I, if you're okay like do you want to talk about your story a little bit how you just kind of because we didn't go over that but i want people to see that sure. eric's a real dude if you're interested sure. in him because i think people if they're gonna want to maybe the few that are listening that are in the same boat that i was a few um well almost like a year when did we start working Oh, I, I don't know. Yeah, man. It's been, <laughs> it's, I, I, about a year. Yeah, let's just say a year. Um, that are in, in that, that boat that want to like, want to trust you. I want to give you an opportunity to just share your story and to show, th to show that to people. So, yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways I can go, but I'll I'll sort of share the higher level one, and we can pull on a string that sounds that sounds interesting, but. What, um, one of the biggest mistakes that I made early in my ministry is I was on that like ministry career ladder. I went to Bible college, seminary, became a youth pastor at like a medium sized church in Jersey, um, and got a job at a large church in where, the Bronx. Where in Jersey? I was in Washington, New Jersey, which is like the northwest part of Jersey. Okay. Um, I kind of near PA, very far from New York. Yeah, okay. And um, I was like 26, 27, somewhere in there, and I applied for a job at at a mega church in New York City and from the youth pastor and I thought 
man, I, I had made it. I had arrived. I was the coolest guy in town, you know, getting a, the mega church job. It was a much better salary. It was in New York City, so it was like trendy and cool and sexy. And it, it ended up being a really dysfunctional, broken situation. So basically, it was a Pentecostal church, an AG church, uh, very highly Latino um, in the congregation. And I didn't know this because I'm a white guy from PA that culturally in the Latino churches, Latin churches, husbands and wives tend to be pastors together. Mm. So the pastor, the pastora, like that's really common. Um, did not know that. That never came up in the job interview. And my wife and I, um, we moved from Jersey to the Bronx, um, White Plains Road. We're living in the church parsonage. So like this is like all brand new. We're not from the city. We don't really know anybody there quite yet. And basically the, the pastor thinks that my wife, she also has a full-time job, she's an RN, is not a pastor, is not in ministry. Um, she, he thinks that she should attend all three services on Sundays. She should attend Friday night youth ministry. She should go on all the trips that the youth go on, so like youth convention, youth camp, youth retreats, and she should counsel all the girls. And of course she should do it for no cost. And uh, I'm not Italian, but I think I, my spirit is Italian, yeah. and I <laughs> and I'm and and I'm like, bro, this is not gonna work, man. I, you're not gonna take advantage of my wife like that. I'm not gonna tolerate it. I'm sorry you hired me, and and that's the end of the discussion. And this guy is freaking head exploded like a pimp, like a bad pimple on her chin. He was so mad. He was like furious. He's like, I can't have a pastor on my staff whose wife is not on board with the ministry. And I'm like, dude, we uprooted our lives and moved here you know, for you. And of course she's on board with the ministry. So to make a long story short, man, we showed up on a Saturday by that Friday, he fired me. So six days later, like, and we we're living in the church parsonage. We hadn't even like unpacked our boxes yet. And it was like, you're done, get out. And if you don't sign an NDA, um, you have to leave the apartment by the end of the day. But if you sign the NDA, which says you can't talk to anybody from the church about this, you can't post it on social media and you can't come on church property. If you don't sign that, then you get to leave right away. If you sign it, I can give you two weeks. So I'm so guessing you was... didn't sign it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I had to sign it or else I wouldn't have a place to live. It was like sign it or you get to get out of the apartment today. Do I gotta cut this stuff. out of the podcast or <laughs> No, no, man. No, no, no. You could you can leave. I mean, at this point it's years ago. No, so I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, water under the bridge, but that was I think that was my wake up call that I don't want to ever be be beholden to a church for my paycheck and my livelihood. Um, like something in me like snapped that day where I realized, oh, like there's not healthy systems in place to protect pastors from situations like this. And I mean, my story was crazy and by God's grace, we, we got through it and I was able to kind of get, you know, still do ministry. Jeez, and um, I ended up, you know, a few years later after some therapy and counseling and healing, planted my own congregation and I, kind of looked at that as like i'll do the bible vocational thing for a while um and then we'll kind of see what, what happens but you know i planted a church in one of the poorest communities in america in one of the in the most expensive city in the world so it takes a lot of money to <laughs> sustain ministry i'm facing new york city so yeah, yeah, um, yeah so i was always i was always a bible guy I had a great team of people around me as well I had an executive pastor who was amazing so curious what um, year is this roughly uh, year, the year I moved to the New York or the year that I planted the church? Uh, I guess both. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we moved to the Bronx in 2014. Oh. All Saints planted in 2017. Okay. So um, not like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not that long ago. No, no, not that long. I mean, it's 2023 now. So, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so that was, that was like why I feel really passionate about this kind of stuff. And I don't share that part of the story with every podcast I go on to because I know I don't like there as much stuff like you, Anthony. <laughs> so, oh, oh. But but uh, I think sometimes people wonder like, oh man, Eric, looking at your Twitter, there's always like a chip on your shoulder. Like, what's up with that? It's like because I love pastors, and I don't want to end up in a situation like I was where because of a miscommunication and a and a ministry position, then you can almost end up homeless. Um, yes. So that's that's why I'm pretty passionate about the work I do. Yeah, well, that that's I I holy crap I can I can actually imagine that, and most people probably can't, and I feel like I can because I moved from New York to North Carolina for ministry, and 
three years later, I felt what well, you felt, obviously not to the extent, but that was after three years. Just like yeah. literally that soon happening. Yeah, but it didn't, I don't. Didn't eat where I and then because I just got hey. married. I just got, yeah, I was like so excited to start my ministry career. And yeah. if that would happen to me, I, <laughs> you know, it'd be crazy. So I, I, um, and, and I, and I'm what? grateful to you that you actually spent time healing from that and yeah. not running away bitter or angry and like sitting in that. Yeah, man. I mean, it wasn't easy for sure, but the thing that I had to like separate myself from that experience was, you know, all people, including pastors are fallen, broken people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we make dumb decisions and we, and we do idiotic things. And now I am able to do what I do, which is kind of help advise pastors like, Hey, you might want to think about this before you uproot your family and, and, and make it as a traumatic change or before you decide to go full time at a church where don't we know the pastor or what's going on over there. So yeah. I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I know most places I'm sure are, are, are better than that was uh, for sure. But at the same time, it's, it's valuable to have some skills in your back pocket to, to keep yourself afloat. That's just all. I'll keep going back to that same same point, but I think it's so valuable. Yeah, and luckily, like, I have, I feel like I have some, <laughs> some skills. So. You do, 100%, <laughs> man. So, yeah, and, um, yeah, I think that is, like, I was like, okay, I could do this, I think, but then I'm realizing now running a business, like, even if you're in some sort of leadership role, like, I and do I see, like, yeah, going into the marketplace is not as scary as it could or as, as it, like, felt, at least for me, at least talking my experience, like, it felt like, because I grew up in high school where there was, like, maybe four Christians, and it felt like I was going back to high school again in, in the sea yeah. of people that hate you, and, uh -huh. and I, I obviously my story's a little bit different where it's not like that, but... um but yeah, it like from at least other conversations I've had with people where it's like, you know, the marketplace is actually sick and I feel like you could do real actual ministry if your perspective is shifted where you can actually reach people where they're at better than, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody that pretty much said that same thing. Like, yeah, I was in ministry for um, for X amount of years. And then when I went to the marketplace place and had a real job i was like oh i'm actually doing real ministry and i even felt that like uh, there is there's when i started freelancing um i felt like i was serving people and i felt like i was my whole life now is to serve other people in this need that they had that then i can excel in not for money's sake but to bless them and be a blessing and so uh, in a sense i feel the same way in a weird way it's just you have to reframe your mind from that um, yeah, yeah, man. Can I ask you? A, can I ask you a question? Can we try change the change tables a bit for the interview? Yeah, please. Because, because I'm wondering, like, was your experience in ministry, like, it wasn't really being with people and sharing your life with them and ministering to them. It was more planning events and planning spaces to minister to people. Is that kind of what your experience was? Yeah, I mean, for majority of it was students. So. It was being the best I could do is being at schools and sure. I, and that even is such a weird concept and um, it's actually a blessing that I missed out on um, because like being from New York like I never saw pastors walking around but in my context no. that actually was like a thing and I like missed out on that <laughs> and I never really got Dang. that <laughs> um, so I miss out on that but yeah no it's just planning events it's planning programs and not like discipling people and yeah you go out to coffee and this is the thing you go out to coffee with these people but they're bringing their best foot forward and to me discipleship doesn't happen in coffee you know moments it happens in the times i got to see them for who they are in their home in their kitchen uh over like i talked about why i want to do this podcast or the f future of this podcast where we're at a dinner table because that's where you get a little bit <laughs> more of that person and that's where you can i believe form disciples better um so yeah it was prepping for for me it was i love sermon writing i love creating content right for that I love. and i loved as a musician i loved creating worship experiences and it was, but it was for majority of the time. It was for the event and not discipling people, equipping people. Yeah, man. No, I asked that question because I, I've 
working with pastors and helping them transition to the marketplace. And that's why we're titled in this pot, podcast, I think, the pastor who has made pastors millions or whatever. Yeah, yeah something can like help. that, yeah. <laughs> We, we've helped, we have a lot of pastors, you know, make more money, never millions, but if you compound all their salaries together, it's, it's in that range. Well, he's, and, part, I just want to stay on record. He's made me personally $10 million just yesterday alone. <laughs> so I'm swimming in cash. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, man. I bet that beef is going to have a glow up in no time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm blessing my parents with a new baby. No, I'm kidding. Um, I love that. No, but the thing with it is, man, is like people ask me, what do pastors come back to you and say? They leave ministry or they go co-vocational, they go to the marketplace. Do they come back at you and say, Eric, I want to wring your neck because I ruined my life? And it's like, I haven't had that yet. <laughs> but what I have had, a lot of people said, man, I am having fun. I'm learning. I'm with people. I'm hearing their stories. And to your point, Anthony, I'm having a ministry to the people in my workplace that I could never have in my ministry in the church because they're not going to wander into a church, but they're going to exactly. come to work every day. Yes. Um, and also to this stigma, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've experienced this and also mm -hmm. for other reasons, but the stigma of pastor, like once you get labeled as a pastor, it's, there's this invisible barrier that it's like, yep. So hard to cross and so hard to relate. Cause then it's like, you're holier, okay, you know, whatever. And I think that's also a cultural thing that's unnecessary, but mm -hmm. If you don't have that label, you can then just be real. And I've seen, I've seen that already. So <coughs> I saw that. Yeah, I saw I mean, that when I was a DJ producer. But that was because like people were like, "Oh, you're doing this. this is so cool. I love what you're doing." Um, then when I said, "Hey, I'm going into ministry," it was like, uh, you, "You're weird." But I'm like, "I'm doing this because I want to help you follow Jesus." And now I get right. to be in a spot where. Um, I don't have to say, hey, I'm a pastor, and it gets okay. blocked off, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, and kind of going back to that earlier conversation, like, why do people get into ministry? It's because they want to serve and disciple and bless and make a difference for the kingdom. It's, well, what's the avenues in which to do that? It's the church and it's the marketplace and it's the neighborhood and society. I was um, also mentored um, by Steve Pike, who does um, Urban Islands Project, and one of the things that he kind of share with me that was really profound he's like you have to look at your ministry as everybody within your network so that includes not just the folks who show up to your church on sunday but like who are your neighbors across the hall or across the street like do yeah, you yeah. know their, sto their, their stories their dreams their hopes their pain points and i think for a lot of pastors it's my first half of my ministry where i was just full-time in the church I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. Because all my time and energy was spent getting ready for Sunday or getting ready for Wednesday night or getting ready for the next, you know, youth conference or convention. It was, you know, who cares about what's happening around me in the community? It's interesting because we still about study the life in Jesus. It was never a, can't think of a single time in his ministry where he sat down and said, okay, we're going to be my, my, my three points for my sermon on, you know, on Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was, he was always walking, walking with people where they were. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's just like a thing that we miss because we see the Bible through our own lenses and totally. trying to adapt to that. But, um, uh, I was going to say something and I just, I just forgot it. But, um, do you, I guess then where, I guess, where do you, do you have any expert, I kind of touched on this before, but do you see, where do you see the church going in the future from here on out yeah man i well the thing is i don't have the numbers in front of me but i heard this recently it's i might be off by a couple of years but i believe in 2020 ish somewhere in that range the average age for a pastor in america was 44. um in 2023 the average age for a pastor is 57. <laughs> um so that's a word of dramatic leap for a yeah. very short <laughs> amount of time and i could be like a little bit off there someone can fact check me in the comments if that's okay it won't hurt my feelings i'm, I'm admitting that I'll, i'm admitting i don't have a perfectly we don't have a, a jamie here like the joe rogan podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. i got i'll get one of those soon <laughs> uh, we'll get one of those soon but basically the age of an average age of a pastor has gone up substantially uh, like close to 15 years um and I was, I was in a conversation on a podcast and the question was posed to me, well, well, why is that? And I said, honestly, I think from my perspective, um, we live in a digitized world. We have more exposure to 
different career paths and different you know opportunities and everything than than the people did in generations past and i think that more people are realizing in our generation gen z millennials that there's opportunities out there to work and to earn money and be creative and have multiple streams of income um more than there ever has been in the history of humanity so why would i not take advantage of those um opportunities that are right in front of me so if you tell someone who's i don't know 20 years old or 18 19 years old hey go to a four-year bible college accrue you know 80k in debt go to a three-year seminary get an md of accrue 50k more in debt okay now you're 24 you have 130k in student loan debt maybe a little bit less but you know you have you have a lot and you're going to go down a career path that at best you know not at best but just most likely you're going to be pastoring you know 60 to 70 people making 50k a year and that and that's going to be your life it's like uh that's not a very attractive proposition for most people yeah so but we end the but what is an attractive proposition and i would love to talk about this with you anthony if someone let's just take your case study long island you, you do ministry on long island god calls you to find the church if you say hey listen I got like four other families from all over America that have a heart for Long Island. We all have jobs. We all have skills. We all can find ways to make money. What if we all intentionally moved to a city together or a town together, you know, bought homes, worked jobs, raised our kids together, became a community, and then did ministry in that community together? It's like, as someone who has three kids, five, four, or one, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna do that, because that sounds pretty sweet. Get to impact people for Jesus, get to live in a cool place, get to like work my job, get to have an extension of my family to support me. That sounds a lot better than going to seminary, taking out a bunch of debt, and being a solo pastor of 60 people. I'm gonna say this, and I hope I get canceled for this. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that is, I think, what the church is supposed to be, dude. Like, you mm -hmm. just described, like, what like what what a, that's what we're supposed to, like that's what we're supposed to be and so I, I was having this interesting conversation and i'm like uh and just kind of like the the loneliness that are in a lot of evangelical churches is i don't know the studies but it's super high um yeah and and like the way of jesus has a better what you just described is i think can cure loneliness and it um, mm -hmm. and could cure a lot of different problems but no like what that he wanted it. was yeah, an yeah, accountability yeah. partner mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. for like so that he could stop you know stop. looking at stuff online and that would cure yeah. loneliness and i'm like no i and, it, and it's like people think i'm crazy or people don't get it unless they start really thinking about it but like the the whole your whole church experience should be that that community where you're not experiencing that loneliness. And it, to me, that is such more of a satisfying, enriched answer. And the best that churches can do, kind of like, hey, that's what small groups are for. But that's not like, I know the life of those small groups, but yeah, what you're describing is like, in my mind, missional communities is another way of describing it, or uh, I feel like a more missional minded house church, um, but especially in the community, neighbors like that. And so, yeah um and that's all right so man go, go. I, no what? i pulled up the data i pulled up the data so here it is according in march 2022 so that's literally a year and a half ago 42 percent of pastors said they want to quit um 56 percent of them was the immense stress of the job 43 percent of them was i feel isolated and lonely uh 29 percent i'm unhappy with the effect this role has had on my family mm. and like just you know, think about all those things. Like, it can be isolated by what you just described. A group of people on mission together, caring for each other, supporting one another, and bringing others into that community to build the kingdom of God. The stress is eliminated because it's not a solo pastor. Yes. You're not lonely and isolated to do it with others. Yes. And uh, the effect that ministry has on your family, which is not to be discounted, it's massive, but that's, you know, protected because you have other families that are supporting you. That sounds pretty badass if I do say so myself. Yeah, no, and that's like, that's at least what I've experienced with people is like, you got to paint that vision, dude. And oh, and a lot of it is honestly just reading scripture in its own context. That's where I've like, where I've seen it flourish. 
But then, yeah, just realizing the Americanized individual nuclear family mm-hmm. is just such a flawed system that I don't I could go off on that. But one of the things I want to mention this before I forget again. But when you just mentioned like there's new opportunities, what I realized why I want to go into ministry was because I want to create messages and be a creator in a sense. And I feel like a lot of people want to do that to write books and preach on. But now that we have YouTube, other ways, and Ruslan KD talks about this a lot, and, I, and he kind of like started making me realize like <laughs> there's a difference between like a shep, local Devil. pastor shepherd and like someone that wants uh-huh. to write books and wow. be an author and a speaker, which are both necessary. But then we get guys that want to be these entrepreneur, business-minded leaders, thought leaders, creators that are in these local churches, and that's where we get the dysfunction. Um, but now we have this opportunity to, in a sense, there's a w- outlet for a creator that doesn't have to be, you know, like the pastor and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, man. No, I think I think you're spot on with that, and it's um, yeah. I think that unfortunately, a lot of what we've done in ministry, I never really thought about it that way too. How the like the their individualism that's so adamant in America has pervaded our churches as well. That's why we have like these pastors who are on pedestals. And that's why they feel the immense pressure, and that's why they get burnt down. And that's why things go wrong because they're not supposed to do it alone. You know, even Jesus Christ sent his disciples out two by two. Yeah, you know, it's like why do you do that? And, and he then- knew something, didn't he? Yeah, and scriptures, uh, and one of my friends uh, like made me realize this. He was like, "Scripture says, in the world will know by the way you love each other." And he was talking oh, about yeah. a group, and I always thought like, "Oh, the way you love that person individually." But like, you know what's gonna, especially in our polarized, dis- like horrible culture, like if we got a bunch of Christians that show unity, love that are like maybe left right but they love together and the world sees that then it's like oh there is a god because if you guys can sit at the same table and do life together and we just have that powerful message and ideal that uh does yeah because of our individualistic that's a whole other rabbit trail andy crouch talks about that a lot um i don't know if you're a fan of andy crouch but his books have opened my eyes to that but um yeah is there anything else you want to say before we kind of land the plane and you kind of um just uh yeah we i want to ask rapid fire fun questions before we close yeah, yeah man well first of all i think a lot i think our thank you anthony for having this fun conversation with me and there was a lot of a lot of joy to be together and we're excited for how our friendship will continue to blossom for many years to come and i think the last thing i would say is that there was a time in my life in my ministry where i thought that bivocational co-vocational pastors that was like the jv of ministry <laughs> um, if you, if, like if you were if you were a Bible guy, you couldn't quite make it to the big leagues because you just weren't good enough. And my my paradigm has has shifted. And the line that I oftentimes share with people is that a you know, Bible vocational pastor is not half the pastor. Um, mm. They're twice the pa- they're twice the pastor because they have a ministry both in their church and in the marketplace. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, enc- I'd encourage your listeners that maybe you think I could never do that. I could never go out and, you know, find a side gig or do something else besides this. Like just pray on it, you know, think on it. It might help mitigate some of the challenges you're facing and give you exposure to people in your community you wouldn't otherwise have. And if our services can be a benefit, we'd love to uh, schedule some time with you. Yes, please. Links in the bio, links in the description, wherever you're listening or watching this, please, please hit up IHelpPastorsGetJobs.com. But before we go, we I got three rapid it. fire questions. You can't spend too much time thinking on it. Number one, what is your pet peeve? Biggest pet peeve. Shit. Biggest pet peeve. I mean, obviously some New York answers, slow walkers. <laughs> people, just, pe- people who walk slow, just they drive me nuts. Okay, good. Um, if you wrote a book, if you had to write a book tomorrow, what would it be about? I'm guessing all this stuff that we talked about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be about ministry sustainability without money stress. Okay, good. If you all right, two more. If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh shoot! Come on now. Let me. You know what, man? Let me just do some spaghetti and meatballs. Get all Let's the go. Essential, all the essential no, food groups. Not yeah, not PA, not from PA, <laughs> but somewhere from the Bronx. What was yeah. your What was your favorite slice in New York City? That you like? like a, oh man, undoubtedly Fulmer Pizzeria on Arthur Avenue, bro. That was okay. my go-to, man. That was the best. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a bunch, but uh, L and B is top. 
tier for me. Yeah, um, and, how, and then what? So back to the book question. What would the be? Uh, what would the title of the book be about? About you if your worst enemy wrote it? <laughs> I've never once considered that question. Man. I, guess <laughs> I I probably would say my worst enemy would probably say Eric the Egomaniac. That's what it would be called. Eric the Eagle Maniac. <laughs> Dude, that's like, that's crazy because I don't think that at all. <laughs> I know. My worst enemy, here, if I'm thinking of the person right now, I'll probably say, yeah, Eric's the Eagle Maniac. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why <laughs> that's why you need to get off Twitter because Twitter's toxic. and uh, Exactly. But that's where you have, that's where I found you, so I'm glad you're on Twitter. <laughs> uh -huh. everyone, everyone tells me, go to Threads, go to Threads, but to me, it's been a ghost town over there. Oh, yeah, no, Threads is not, yeah, Threads is dead, so... Um, at least awesome. that's what I've seen. But um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, it was a pleasure, and um, I hope that, like I, like you said, we continue working together for many years to come. So appreciate all you yeah, do right. for the kingdom. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, brother. Take care.